I, I actually plan to record just in case you may want to refer to this later, but I forgot. I forgot. I'm just starting to do that now. But I think a little recap can still uh, be very useful for you if you come across the video later. So what I've said so far is that nutrition is the science of food, their actions and interaction and balance in relation to health and disease, which means that food can affect health. Foods such as fruits and vegetables are actually called healing foods and they can help people to get better in their health if uh, they have health challenges. Whereas foods such as uh, processed foods, processed cereals are actually disease causing because they lack fiber, they contain a lot of sugar or high fructose syrup or fat, especially um, bad type of fat and they cause diseases. So, and then I went on to explain that public health nutrition is a branch of human nutrition that is concerned with the nutritional problems that affect large numbers of people and are better solved or most effectively resolved through group action. So the problems of public health nutrition is not what individuals can resolve. We need the uh, cooperation of communities, community leaders, uh, along with the state, with the government, with the those people in private sectors, commercial sectors, people that manufacture food. We need the co cooperation of different uh, sectors to collaborate and ensure that public health nutrition is accomplished and that the, the, the core functions of public health will come in in fulfilling the, the, this public health nutrition goal. Nutritional status is the assessment of the state of nourishment of a patient. And I explained that when you carry out this assessment, you, the result can be from a, an extreme of a spectrum that is referred to as severe micro, severe undernutrition to moderate and mild undernutrition. And then in the middle of the spectrum, you have those who are healthy people, or you call them or people that have normal weight. And then you go to the other side of the spectrum, those who are overweight, um, obese, or morbidly obese. I also explained that nutritional status is affected by the quantity, quality of food, as well as physical health. So those who have a state of physical health that is debilitating or uh, waste nutrients will, will emerge as undernourished. Give an example of HIV. Another example is diabetes. Some people that have diabetes may even appear as undernourished. Meanwhile, what is going on in them is the inability of the insulin to process the food, the sugar that they are taking. And some of them can appear as overweight and obese, still based on that malfunctioning of the insulin. And then we went on to explain the fact that public health nutrition is different from clinical nutrition. So you can see that clinical nutrition is another branch of human nutrition. And they are different in diverse ways, such as the focus, the target, the setting, and the strategies. So the focus for public health nutrition is prevention, while the focus for clinical nutrition practice is treatment. The target for public health nutrition is population, and the target for clinical nutrition practice is the individual. The setting for public health nutrition in the states and communities, the setting for clinical nutrition is clinics. Strategies for public health nutrition, there are multiple, there are many strategies. It's education, food demonstration, food diversity, different types of strategies that are used to achieve public health nutrition, but for clinical nutrition, is majorly counseling and education. Somebody comes to your clinic, you counsel the person, this is what to do, and the person goes ahead to do it. So we go on to basic concepts in human nutrition. It's important that you understand what food is, how is food different from nutrients, what is diet. These are simple terms, and we can call them primary school terms, if you still remember. <laughs> 
but as simple as they are, please make sure you master them. They are very important. Food is any substance which, when you ingest, uh, provides necessary raw materials for the structure and functions of life. So anything that you ingest but does not provide raw materials, even if it's palatable, it's sweet, then we cannot call it real food. Maybe it's just chemical. <laughs> so you can begin to think of things that people consume, especially drinks, that don't provide any necessary raw material for functions of life or for structure. They, 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 they are just concentrates. Those are no foods. Then when we talk about diet, is the combination of food that is eaten habitually. So you will see that diet is like many foods arranged habitually. Food and diet, they go together. Please note that uh, the word diet has been bastardized, but it doesn't change the real meaning. So when you see somebody who says he's dieting, what that person is saying is that he or she is taking fat diet. Maybe one food group is out of that person's diet and is consuming the others, like people that will say no carb diet. Or some people will concentrate on just one food group, it's still a fat diet. You see people who just concentrate on fruits and vegetables because it helps them to lose weight. So they say they are dieting. It's a colloquial use. What they are engaged in is fat diet. That's the correct word. That's the technical word, fat diet. And let me say at this point, we might still come to it, but you remember this is just introduction. That fat diet is not desirable. It's not right. When we get to the topic on obesity and how to overcome it, I would uh, say more on the correct way to achieve weight control. I have lost 20 kilograms of body weight practicing the right things, and I've kept it away for about 13 years. So I can tell you confidently, <laughs> apart from science and research, that uh, there are correct ways of people managing their weight and not following fat diet. And what is important is the uh, ability to keep it away. Anybody can lose weight. If you don't eat, you can lose weight, but one can lose weight and lose a health and one can lose weight and gain it back. So when you see people lose weight, it's not enough to rejoice or praise them. You need to find out for how long they have kept it away. Nutrients now. I've taken time to explain food and diet, and I want you to know that it's different from nutrients. Examples of food groups are fruits and vegetables. You know, I was talking about people consuming one food group and leaving the others. Fruits and vegetables, roots and tubers, grains or cereals. These are all food groups. That means there are examples of foods in these groups. Please master them. Uh, we could have dedicated the whole class to food groups, diets, and all of this, but because the time is limited, uh, we just encourage you, because these are basic terms that one should have learned in undergraduate days. So I will encourage you to pick up some books and brush your knowledge on food and food groups because they are undergraduate stuffs. Examples of fruits, vegetables, examples of roots, yam, potato, examples of tubers like cassava or um, tiger nuts, yes. That's, those are exam examples of tubers, yam, potato, tiger nuts. Then examples of roots, cassava, yeah. Then grains is also called cereals. Examples include rice, sorghum, rye, millet. Examples of legumes, white beans, red beans, pinto beans, examples of meat, 
always remember that in the nutrition parlance, meats group include fish, egg, and other animal products, whether chicken or beef. Then the milk group include the milk, whether whole milk or low-fat milk or cheese. Anything made from milk would belong to that milk group, including yogurt, then fat and oil. In that group, the ones from plant origin are referred to as oil, while the ones from animal origin are referred to as fat, except fish oil. Fish oil is from animal origin, but it's called fish oil because it's LD. It's LD like plant-based oil. And most fats from animals are not LD in large amounts because they are full of saturated fat. And then when uh, plant-based oil is heated at very high temperature, it releases trans fat, which is not LD. I'm sure I will still mention it in the course of these lectures. So I've explained food diets, I've looked at the food groups, and I want you to know they are different from nutrients. Nutrients include carbohydrates, proteins, fats and oil, vitamins, minerals, and water. So you see that they are different from the food groups. So please, if I ask you, what food group is rice? Can somebody please unmute and answer? What food group is rice? Grace. Very good. This is a, a good class. So rice is not carbohydrates. Rice belongs to the cereal group or grains. And I like you to please note that there's no single food that you can refer to as a nutrient because each food contains different nutrients. So no matter the high level of carbohydrates in rice or yam, you cannot call yam carbohydrates because there are other nutrients, including micronutrients in yam. You'll be surprised if you analyze rice, there's protein in rice, you cannot call it carbohydrates. So I believe that if we go through this program and we confidently say that we went through a uh, master's in public health in the University of Lagos, we should not belong to the group of people that will call one food carbohydrates. So I hope that is clear. The only food group that seems to bear the same name with the nutrients is fat and oil, fat and oil. So when you see examples of fat and oil, the nutrient is also fat. When the nutrient is not oil, it's fat. Another concept that is good to know is recommended dietary allowance. Recommended dietary allowance. You no, know, there's a temptation to call it recommended daily allowance, but it's dietary allowance. Don't fall into that temptation. The average daily level of intake that is sufficient to meet the nutrient requirements of most people is what is referred to as recommended dietary allowance. So it's, it's, it's good to know that concept because along the line, you apply it to what you are learning, for example, how much calories does Mr. Adebeko need per day <laughs> to live a good life without developing pot belly? Can somebody please answer? And you can answer by yourself. <laughs> how much calories would you need from food? Does somebody have to answer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody has to please answer. Okay. Dr. Debeckon, you answer the question. Is it Dr. Debeckon? <laughs> okay, no, Sajayi, you can answer for him now. 2,500 to 2,500 kilocalories. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So let's assume I've never seen him before, but you know, you, you have seen him. So you, you are better in the judgment. If he's tall, 
taller than 1.6. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's taller than 1.6 meters. And um is has a big frame, broad shoulders, big bones. Maybe he needs as much as 2700 But if he has a small frame, which I doubt from his voice, <laughs> he might need just 2500 So that's the understanding that in a day, what calories you need depends on age, gender, and activity level. So maybe we should have added body build too. Body build. That's, so how old is this person? If you are over 40, then your calorie need should be less than that of 20 year old. So now I'm a woman. So that means gender will make me take less than Mr. Debeku. I, I have a small frame, so I don't need more than 2,200. And my activity level is not very high. I try to do my exercise every day. I, I, uh, had moderate exercise walking for about 40 minutes a day. But all despite that, I'm not as active as bricklayers. <laughs> so I don't need as much calories as they would need. And if I'm taking the same calorie that my 22-year-old son is taking, then I'm not eating right because at my age, I should be taking less than my 22-year-old son. So those are, these are the ways uh, these things are worked out. Then protein for most, at all adults generally, need 0 0.8 grams per kg, 0 0.8 grams per kg. Then fat and oil, 56 to 90 grams, depending on the age. So, uh, Water, men need three liters and women 2.5. By and large, a wide variety of foods are needed every day to meet micronutrient needs. So it's wrong for anyone to stick to just one food group or to eliminate a particular food group from one's diet. About 20 different, biologically different foods are needed per week. And that's very easy to achieve. So if in the morning you decide to eat healthy, you take a cup of uh, Moringa tea, and then thereafter eat sweet potato and vegetable sauce with fish. Just that meal has about four biologically different foods, Moringa, Tomato, most people that will prepare sauce in Nigeria will add that pe pepper, tomato, onion, that's already three. Then the vegetable, that's four. The potato is five. So if in the afternoon you decide to eat correctly again and not just drink junks or, or eat junks, in one week you will definitely get more than 20 biologically different foods if you don't eat monotonous food. So I'm using you just for this lecture to be smooth and interesting. But remember that you are training to become specialists and what I'm directing to you is what you are expected to interpret and apply to the public, not necessarily you as a person. So I move on to the concept of nutritional assessment and intervention. The first thing I like to say is that before an intervention takes place in a community or wherever, state, nation, there must be an assessment. So even if we have funding agencies who are willing to carry out um, some programs, and then we are, we are in, in a in in the circumstance now where there's a lot of political integrity, people are trying to impress the populace. 
and they may just come up with an idea of a health program. As specialists, we should know and be able to educate people that there shouldn't be an intervention without an assessment is, is a waste. So there must be assessment. Then the goal of the assessment can be to identify individuals and populations, groups who are at risk of becoming malnourished or identify those who are already malnourished. Please, when we mention or hear the word malnutrition or malnourished, remember that spectrum, very, very important. That it involves undernutrition and overnutrition. And undernutrition can be protein energy undernutrition or micronutrient deficiency. So it can be macronutrient deficiency or micro. Can please somebody please unmute and tell us the difference between macronutrients and micronutrients? Anybody? Are we together? Okay, for the sake of time, macronutrients are the ones that are necessary in the body in large amounts, such as carbohydrates, protein, fat, and oil, while micronutrients are the ones that are needed by the body in small amounts, micro amounts. Those are concepts that are very, very important. You cannot go through this course without that understanding. So the goal of assessment can be to identify those who are malnourished or healthcare programs to develop healthcare programs that meet the, the needs of the community. So if we have identified those who are malnourished, we've identified the nutrition problems in that community, then we can institute the goal can be, okay, when we do the survey, then we institute the solution, the healthcare programs that will meet their needs. And then when we carry out the intervention, we can measure the effectiveness of the nutritional programs. How do we assess nutritional status? There's going to be a lecture on this, but just to have a taste today, there are four major methods and you can master them as A, B, C, D. So that way you will not forget A, B, C, D, anthropometric method, biochemical assessment, clinical assessment, or dietary. You can put method or assessment. So malnutrition is a concept. And as I've been emphasizing, is insufficient, excessive, or imbalanced consumption of nutrients that are not present in different ways in the body. So when it's insufficient, it presents as undernutrition. When it's excessive, as overweight or obesity. When it's imbalanced, it, it can present in an interesting way. You can see somebody who is obese and at the same time is suffering from eating hunger. Person is obese, has excess macronutrients stored, at the same time, deficient micronutrients in the body. That's a very common situation. So anytime you see obesity, it might coexist with micronutrient deficiency. According to the World Health Organization, malnutrition is the gravest single threat to the world's public health. And these nutrition disorders depend on the nutrient that is deficient or overabundant in different parts of the world. In Nigeria and other parts of Africa or the developed or developing world, this imbalance is most frequently associated with undernutrition and micronutrient deficiency. Whereas in the Western world, it's more associated with overweight and obesity. So poor diet can have an injurious impact on health causing underweight or stunting, kwashioko, marasmus. Kwashioko, marasmus are referred to as protein energy under nutrition. The micronutrient deficiency, I've emphasized that today. The bad thing is that when a child is growing up with deficient 
calcium and vitamin D, especially females, that can lead to osteoporosis much later in life. Then the other parts or the other spectrum of malnutrition, overweight and obesity can also lead to non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. These are this combination, they travel together and their family name is metabolic syndrome. So whenever you hear metabolic syndrome, it means a situation where you have at least three of the following conditions. Cardiovascular, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes or hyperglycemia, then obesity, especially abdominal obesity. So when three out of all th those four conditions exist together, they referred to as metabolic syndrome. Please note this term is very important in this course. So if we carry out nutritional assessment and we discover undernutrition or overnutrition, over time, we discover that in different populations, some people are more vulnerable than others. In Nigeria and other developing countries, this group of people are the vulnerable groups. Remember, the most important problem here is undernutrition. So these vulnerable groups are pregnant women, lactating mothers, children, especially those under five years, these people require proportionately more energy for each kilogram of body weight than adults. So if they are not properly fed, they can easily tip into undernutrition. And a lot of problems are associated with this, especially poor brain development, which eventually leads to poor cognition. So when you see many children who are not doing well academically and are not very productive in Nigeria, don't blame them, <laughs> blame, their, blame their parents and the country as a whole for not giving these people a chance to have proper nutrition in early life, especially the first 1,000 days of life. The adolescents are also vulnerable because uh, they require as much energy as adults. They're very active. During that stage, puberty sets in and puberty is associated with sporting growth. There is increase in metabolic rates. All of these require a lot of energy and nutrients. So if they're not supply in adequate amount, they become vulnerable. And if you can imagine if an adolescent girl now gets pregnant, the problem is compounded and is very common. So that child that is still growing that needs a lot of energy and nutrients, as an extra woman being to take care of within the sparse uh, nutrients available, and that's a complicated problem. Please, in this course, can you write down intergenerational malnutrition? It's very, very important. Another concept that I need you to write down that I've not seen on this slide yet and become a process later is Baker's theory. Baker's theory, which was formed from Baker's hypothesis. So that concept is also very important. Then the concept of intergenerational undernutrition is very important. So the idea there, I'll come to it in this slide, but I just didn't want to forget. So uh, the, the, this, the, the woman is pregnant and that period is prenatal nutrition. What happens? Nutrients affect the heads of the mother and the fetus. The heads of the fetus is important and it depends on that of the mother. But we need to know that the fetus is not a total parasite. That means whatever happens to the mother will affect the fetus. The fetus cannot just depend on the mother and live like a parasitic organism and survive. If the mother is not well fed, it will eventually affect the fetus. And as public health specialists, this knowledge is very important for us to 
make advocacy for maternal health and maternal nutrition. There are many problems, especially in this part of the world, that can affect maternal nutrition and health. These women of reproductive age, especially the ones from poor homes, they are overworked. They have less access to good nutrition. Even the little money available to purchase food, they would rather feed the husband and the children well while they suffer. And they, they have no, many of them have no support for child care. They, some of them are engaged in more than one jobs and come back home to take care of children. So they are overworked. That leads to depletion of energy and nutrients. And at the end of the day, they have many children, high parity. So that further worsens the depletion and leads to problems which can affect the child. So inadequate care is a cause of malnutrition, and this can lead to interuterine growth retardation, fetal death, stillbirth, or small for age or low birth weight. If that child that is born of this overworked, malnourished woman is born without any intervention and goes through the first 1,000 days of life without any intervention, that child may also grow up to become stunted, become a stunted adolescent, a stunted adult. And of course, because there is low reserve of energy and nutrients, that will affect her own child. So there's another generation, the third generation. If there's no intervention, the third generation will still be undernourished. And that leads us to the concept of intergenerational malnutrition. So it could be intergenerational undernutrition, or in the other way around, if there's too much surplus of nutrients and energy, and there's high consumption of this surplus, the mother gives birth to an overweight baby, which becomes an overweight and obese adult, and that one gives birth to overweight and obese child again, that would be intergenerational overnutrition. So our baby is born. What happens? What should we do nutrition wise? This period is important for both mother and child. Highly nutritious foods are important to keep energy high and make production stable. So if the mother is not well fed, especially uh, in terms of liquid and protein consumption, she might not be producing enough milk, and that will mean that the child is not properly fed. Apart from this, she needs good diet for her to recover quickly. That first 1,000 days of life is the window of opportunity to feed a child and allow that child to make up for any loss in terms of nutrition during pregnancy. So that means the child must be properly fed. For the first six months of life, the gold standard is exclusive breastfeeding. No mixture, no, no water, no drink, no drugs. That's the standard, that's still the standard. Of course, people would argue it in different ways. What if the child is a twin? Uh, there are two of them. How can the breast milk be enough? It will be enough. God already knows that woman is going to have a twin, going to have a set of twins. So the breast milk will be enough as long as she's not overworked, she's relaxed, rest well, and eats well. The, a mother can feed twins on exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Between six months and 24 months, the child should be on complementary feeding. Remember this concept is also very important, complementary feeding. That means introducing foods that, that, that is still adequate for the child's nutrition. 
And there are many factors that are important to make it succeed. Another concept is predominant breastfeeding, and this is not encouraged. Very common in Yoruba land, where the child is on exclusive breastfeeding and a little water is added. Mixed feeding is also not encouraged. That's a situation where breastfeeding is practiced along with uh, infant formula. Then replacement feeding, though not encouraged, is required in certain situations such as feeding refugee or children who have lost their mothers. We come to another concept, another topic that somebody is going to teach you, which is community nutrition program. So if you carry out an, um, an assessment in a community and discover the challenge in that community, then you may need to carry out interventions in terms of nutrition education, or food diversification, food supplementation, food fortification. So these terms are introduced to you early in this course so that you have an idea of things that you need to master. These terms should be well mastered and you should know the difference. So let me just say that food supplementation means the provision of additional food items to target groups. So what you are giving is food. But for fortification, you are adding micronutrients to food. Or you are giving uh, the, the, the added micronutrients, they are, they are already added from source most of the time. So like salt is fortified with iodine. So as you are taking the salt, you are not even conscious of the iodine. But we also fortify local food, staple food with high proteinous food so, so that the children uh, that feed on these feeds can have enough protein. Another strategy is treatment of cases. And that then we come to how to actually address undernutrition in the nation as a whole. The, all these concepts are also very important. We must pay attention to production of food encourage farmers, preservation is important, inadequate preservation techniques are part of our problems now, which is linked with power supply. So there should be uh, intervention at that level. There of course, poverty is another problem. So we should make sure that the purchasing power of individuals increases that could be through education enlightenment whatever can increase the people's economic power and then of course encourage family planning use of contraceptives so that the pop so population will not just keep increasing at the geometric rate politics is important in every aspect of life so it is in nutrition issues Pol because policies and political decisions dictate a lot. If grants are always available for cash crops rather than food crops, more people uh, will be involved in cash crops and less people will be producing food, which will mean uh, danger to the food basket of the nation. Importance do not allow policies that favor local production. So there has to be a lot of advocacy for local production. I would like you to note the concept of the relationship between nutrition and development. If possible, please write it down. I don't know who's taking the topic that will involve that, but it's central to this course that if nutrition is not well taken care of, it will not it will, it's already affecting our development. So when we look at our level of development and we talk about our GDP and all those economic issues, it doesn't come to people readily, but we as specialists must know that addressing nutrition will address the economic problem in a nation because the most important resource is the human being. So if the human beings, their brains are stunted, 
and their level of productivity is low, then there is no hope for improving the economic situation permanently. So if we want to really improve the economic situation, we have to go back to the level of maternal nutrition and health and ensure that children that are being, baby fetus that are being conceived are well fed to be able to have proper development of their brain, proper cognition development, which will eventually lead to uh, being productive and that will lead to the development of the nation. So what I've said, said within the last few seconds, should be able to write a long answer question on it or discuss it on air for 30 minutes. Then pathology, that's the fact that sickness causes increased demand for nutrients and there's reduced intake and absorption when people are ill. So it's important to pay attention to uh, illnesses or sicknesses or the health system. So that if there's a better health system, it will in turn as address the problem of malnutrition in the nation. So that um, also indicates that you should know the, the link between, I remember uh, a question I set for MPH a few months or a few weeks ago. Very simple, just describe the link between nutrition and infection. So from these three lines, you can, you can write a whole page, the, the, the relationship between nutrition and infection. And it's both ways. So you can start by saying nutrition, good nutrition can actually prevent infection because if somebody is well nourished, then the person has immunity to fight infection. Somebody or if food is prepared in a good way, the hygienic ways can prevent infection. And then on the other hand, somebody who has infection will also affect nutrition. First and foremost, the person will not be able to eat well. So that's reduced appetite, reduced intake. The other thing is the lining of the digestive tract to be affected depending on the type of infection, if it's measles, then the, the person will not be able to absorb the nutrients properly. And then even when the nutrients are absorbed, there's increased demand for the nutrients by, uh, because of the temperature. So what happens? They get wasted. The energy and the nutrients are wasted on the high temperature and the infection. So that's another uh, link. And I'm sure if you think deeply, there will be more. So seeing just one line on a slide, it doesn't mean what you need to learn is one line. You need to expand it and you, you need to understand it. And then uh, finally, there are some recent advances in nutrition which are important to note. Nutrition in HIV condition. The gold standard is still exclusive breastfeeding. It has not changed, but it must be accompanied with uh, the drugs that are usually given to HIV positive mothers. In the past, people were asked to look at the situation and analyze whether infant formula is acceptable, is feasible, is available, is safe, is sustainable. That results in the acronym AFAS. And that if people assess the infant formula and is able to pass this test of available, acceptable, feasible, safe, so sustainable, then those children born to HIV mothers could be on infant formula, but I want to tell you that it's no longer holding. That's no longer acceptable. So the only situation where 
Afas is useful is in feeding infants or refugees. Then please note that in HIV, even though we have explained that it can make people cachectic, it's a wasting disease, uh, you need to give more calories, but there is no sufficient uh, evidence that other nutrients should increase, except they are tested, such people are tested and there are indications to increase nutrients. So calories can be increased, but you don't have to give extra vitamins, minerals to such people because it can actually lead to hypervitaminosis. And that's another problem. Another concept in recent advances is the management of diarrhea with zinc. So ORT has been around for a long time, but right now we are adding zinc. And this zinc can reduce the severity of diarrhea, the duration, the recurrence for up to two to three months. So if a child has diarrhea, the child should not just be given ORT, but zinc should be added. And the dosage is 10 milligrams for children below six months, 10 milligrams. For those who are above six months, 20 milligrams daily for two weeks. Any question at this point before I conclude? I expect you to have questions or comments. Any question? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so please go ahead but, while I take a water break. Okay, but it has to do with the carb diet. There are so many claims about recommended um, dietary habits that some say your Breakfast should have the most calories, and then as the day goes by, you reduce the calories of um, lunch and dinner. I don't know if there's any recommended scientific based scientific based dietary habit of what one should eat as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, thank you. Let me take all the questions together. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hmm. Um, I have a question, ma'am. Hello? Hello? Please Anybody go ahead with your question. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Um, um, you gave us the recommended... Um, calorie intake for males, females. And then I was thinking whether you told us about factors which have affect recommended dietary allowance, such as body build, age, and then gender. I was wondering that when it comes to water, for example, water intake, and um, I think you mentioned um, 2.5 liters for females and three liters for males, whether climate has an important bearing on the quantity of water or the volume of water required daily. For example, in our own um, climate where it's rather hot and people tend to sweat much more than they do in more temperate regions, will that recommended daily um, volume increase? That's my question, ma. Thank you. And then I, I really would want to understand the meaning of the term biologically different foods. Thank you, ma. Okay, I was trying to write but. Let me just answer the ones you've asked. If there's any other question, we'll take them. Uh, so the first question is about the correct way to eat despite all the different recommendations flying in the air. So as a nutritionist, the correct way to eat is for people to eat balanced diet, balanced meal, in a day. In those days, we advocated for balanced meal in a plate. 
And that's how people came about. Half of the place should be vegetable, half of the... But the science has gone beyond that. And what they're saying now is, in a day, within a day, eat from different food groups. Because it, as an nutritionist, if I start telling you how to get your 0 0.8 gram per kg of protein, and I start selling you uh, from one cup of rice, you get seven gram from one cup of beans, it would, it would be complicated to an average mind because your own mind now is even above average. So what we tell the public generally is people should eat from different food groups in a day. If you eat that way, you'll be eating healthy. And then breakfast should be balanced. Lunch, as much as possible, balanced. But if for any reason one particular meal is not balanced, one should strive to balance it with the other two meals in a day. Or if possible, add some snacks to balance it. Are you satisfied? So if when you hear people talk of um, hallelujah diet, for example, what that diet is, expects is that in the morning, one should just take something like a green tea and then you eat every in the afternoon, in the night to go for salad or something, maybe one cooked meal in a day. It's a diet. And I took time to explain at the beginning that when you hear diet, it's the, the correct technical term is a fad diet. That means it's a fad. Some people are just trying to achieve some things that may not be sustainable. So what is important is what is sustainable. And what is sustainable scientifically is to touch all the food groups as much as possible, all the food groups in a day. So if somebody wants to lose weight and the person is looking for a method then the person should eat from all the food groups but reduce the quantity. I have a book here which answers that question. Because it's a question on the mind of several people. This is healthy diet and weight control tips. How can people lose weight without losing their health? Because people that advocate um, drop, advocate that one should drop one food group Maybe they tell you, eat only fruits and vegetables. And because it's effective, if you are getting some results, it's difficult to argue with results. One tends to believe is that, ah, this thing is really working, though. At least I've practiced it too, and it worked, but it wasn't sustainable. So what is sustainable is to make sure you touch different food groups in a day, such that you can have all the nutrients needed in a day. Don't don't eat only fruits and vegetables in a day. You will lose weight, but you also lose your health. People that get engaged in um, ketogenic diets, they avoid carbohydrates, just go for um, animal foods. <laughs> I remember one child, I say, ah, mom, I like this, your diet. It's your diet that you eat three eggs in a day and uh, eat a lot of meat and fish. It's a very interesting diet, you know. And common sense should tell us that you can't be indulging in three eggs in a day, several pieces of beef and fish, and think you can get away with it, you know. It's not safe for cardiovascular system. Such people may also have their, they may damage their liver because of the lack of carbohydrates. So that means the body will keep taking from the reserve in the liver until the liver is damaged if carbohydrate is not supplied. Scientifically, 55% of our foods should be carbohydrates. That's what we need most for energy. So when you now have to depend on your body for energy, the body will be breaking down. And the muscles can even break down if you don't have enough uh, energy and protein. So don't get involved in paleo diet, Atkins diet, Alleluia diet, ketogenic diet. What you should follow is LD diet. And LD diet says eat from all the food groups. You can see different foods on this, on the cover of this book. Corn, carrot, cabbage, 
pepe, fruits. Uh, I can also see potato, onions. Just eat different kinds of things, especially the plant-based food. And then with the right knowledge of what contains protein and micronutrients, one can revenge the body. I remember I was at an event and somebody walked up to me and said, are you Dr. Latona's younger sister? And that day I really felt good because it means I've achieved my aim. I've changed my body <laughs> over some years so that when people could not recognize me again. Eating different foods from different food groups. Have I satisfied you, the first person who asked a question? Who is the first person that has a question? Dr. Palano. Dr. Palano, are you satisfied? Uh, to some extent, ma. <laughs> Which one is it's left? On eh? It's already working on me. It's working on you. It's already working on your recommendations. I can give my dad a treat. Okay. I wish I can hear you quite well, but I can't really hear you. <laughs> okay. This uh, please, please, back. Doctor Falan, are you I beside your wife? <laughs> no, no, not at all, ma. We're in the class. We're in the class. Oh, we're in class. Oh, I just we're in class. Okay. Yes, <laughs> It was just an aside that I mentioned. I don't know what is alluding to. Yeah. I didn't get the comment, but the way you asked like me. Yes, the comment was that your recommendation was what the wife, because the one know is already working on it to oh. give Madam. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then, then the next question, I think, is from Dr. Ajayi. About water. That's pretty. That's a Okay. Dr. Alabi, Dr. Kemi Alabi. It's uh, straightforward. In this part yeah. of the world, that general recommendation is not even enough for us. Because if you if you stick to two point five liters last month, it was very hot last month, it won't be enough. So that's why this is a good class where I'm happy with your comments. The weather will affect, the geographical location will affect, but this is just a general uh, recommendation. Sometimes a male may even, I mean, a female may even have to drink more if you are involved in more activity on a sunny day than a male. So depending on the geographical location, the, and then the time of the year, the weather, and your activities. Those who are engaged in more exercise can even need more water. <laughs> Please don't follow those people that say drink a gallon in the morning. Make sure you spread, no, never. spread the water throughout the day. But we're still going to have a lecture on this. So remember that today we are just testing the different topics in this course. And um, I recommend that you please pick up this book, whether the e copy or the hard copy to familiarize yourself with basic concepts. These books were written for the public. They are not written for MPA students. <laughs> and uh, we sold uh, over 25,000 copies now. This when the last um, batch was printed, there were 22,000. So that gives us uh, 25,000 copies now that have been distributed within and outside Nigeria is useful, not just for you, for your whole family, to get familiarized with basic concepts that every human being should know about food. So you can't claim to go to a master's in public health and you don't know what your neighbor knows <laughs> because the book is in the hand of ordinary people in the public. So that's why it's good for you to know this day. The, the first book, Healthy Diet and Weight Control, contains chapters on water, on fruits, 
vegetables, roots, and tubers, part an oil, processed food, uh, how to calculate your body max in this, and simple, simple things like that. And then you will see on every page of the book how you can apply food to manage weight to prevent non-communicable disease. Remember, this is not just about you. It's about public health. So when we have the right kind of knowledge, we can spread it. Then this second book is like an application of what we're learning to children, uh, uh, talking about breastfeeding, feeding infants and young children, a chapter on complementary feeding, and then the different drinks, adolescents, feeding adolescents, the thrust of this book is the fact that it's possible for a child to be obese, looking well-nourished, but at the same time suffering eating hunger. That's the thrust of this book. And then the special juice is that there's a food menu for one week at the back, free menu for whoever buys the book that can be applied to children at the back of this book. This one also contains one week menu for adults. It's LD spend less. So this book contains not just issues about LD eating, but also uh, the nutrients in common African foods. You see, when you hear people talk about problems and you are passionate about producing, providing solutions, then um, certain things are born. So that's how this book was born, where right? people kept on saying, we don't even know what is in our food. We don't have food in Africa. We do. And then I was wondering, is it really true that we don't have food? So I researched into our foods in Africa and the nutrients. So you can look at Bali, for example, roasted plantain, and you check the nutrients so that when next you are considering roasting plantain in your kitchen or baking it, you are wondering, how is it different from yam and what am I getting out of it? Or at the back of that book, you can compare the calories in sweet potato to yam. There was a time, for almost two years, I ate sweet potato every day when I was trying to lose weight. I realized the calorie is less than that of yam, and I used to like yam a lot. Then you can look at uh, salad, different vegetables, what are the nutrients in them, and then people can plan to eat healthier within a budget. You notice that white beans contains the same nutrients with red beans, and yes, it's cheaper. People can be advised, they can be helped to eat within their budgets and still eat healthy. So the thrust of this book is the economic advantage of paying attention to food and the nutrients they contain so that one can juggle it and choose the ones that are suitable for time. And then finally, uh, if people eat right and don't manage stress, they still become ill and remember that we're not learning about nutrition for learning's sake. It's for the sake of health, the public health. So the link between nutrition and stress is the fact that excess stress appear like overnutrition in the body because the problems that result from it will be like uh, the problems of overnutrition. Excess stress can actually lead to obesity. That's the reason for writing this book. So there's no other question, then we can call it a day. And then you look forward to meeting Dr. Oluwale next week, Friday by 6 p.m. Any comments, any comments? Can I can I say something, Max? Please go ahead. Is it respect to the, the question I asked earlier? Okay. 
in other words, do I take it to mean that there's no particular dietary formula when you're taking calories any time of the day, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, as long as you have the um, food groups adequate and then adequate nutrients in whichever meal of the day you're taking. So it doesn't matter which calories you take, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Oh, no, it matters. Maybe I didn't get you right. The first thing is, what is the total calorie needed? So if you are a male now, and the total calorie needed is about 2,500, then we can divide that into three, right? And yes. then we can say that in the morning, you don't need more than 700 because you shouldn't take too much calorie in the morning. You need more in the afternoon, less in the morning and less at night. So if we divide it into, um, say, 700 in the morning, 700 in the evening, and then 1,000 in the afternoon. If that's, or you can vary. It depends, it really, honestly, it depends on your schedule. So if it's 700, that's all you need in the morning. And then we calculate that um, you're having yam. And from one slice of yam, you're going to have like um, 10 kilocalories. Then we calculate how many pieces of yam you, you need. And then I'm thinking that yam, you shouldn't just take it as carbohydrate like that alone. I mean, supplying a lot of carbohydrates and very little of other nutrients. So that's the reason for eating something along with the yam. Maybe egg sauce or fish sauce or whatever, or vegetable with fish. So there is still a, a, a little planning needed so that you don't exceed that 700 kilocalorie in the morning and you try to touch the different food groups to supply the different nutrients. But the issue is, what is your goal? Every adult has a goal. Your goal may be to just maintain your health, or your goal may be to shed some fat. So the way I was eating when I was trying to lose 20 kilograms of body weight is different from the way I eat now. I'm just maintaining my weight and health. So there's no one size formula that fits all. It depends on what you are trying to achieve. If we have a client who is, for example, I have a webinar within the next couple of hours where I'm going to be training some clients on how to avoid obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. The way such people will eat will be a bit different from the way the, the others who are healthy will eat. I'll be telling them to avoid meat, to avoid uh, too much salt, to avoid processed foods generally. So they will be more conscious of not frying egg compared to others. So the goal, each person has a goal as an adult. You have, but for children, we already know that they should be fed with a diet that will supply sufficient protein. So, and then those who are younger than two years old, diet that will supply high level of iron, iodine, vitamin, all those micronutrients of public health significance public health importance should not be lacking in their diet so that they grow up properly. But as an adult, you are not thinking of vitamin A or thinking of iron. It's not in your thoughts. What you are concerned about is how you will not develop pot belly. So if you ask me as a nutritionist to develop a menu for you, then what I'll be calculating is calories and then putting a lot of vegetables and salad to make sure that though you are eating, you are not getting too much calories into your body because you're not expending a lot. But if a carpenter comes to me and say, uh, as a nutritionist, he wants a menu, 
and I know there is a carpenter or a bricklayer. I won't be too much concerned about adding salad. Maybe salad just once or twice a week. He's free to eat his eba with a lot of vegetable. And he can eat three times a day. He may not even have the time to eat three times a day. So I'll be more concerned about such people getting enough protein because they will naturally go for staple food that have carbohydrates. So this, the situation of a person, the job, the, 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 uh, the resources available, many things come into place when planning meals for people. Are you satisfied? <laughs> Dr. Alabi. I, I think that was the problem. Are you yes, uh, uh, yes, I am. Uh. Oh, better. Okay. By the yes. time we get to today is not that topic. I just touched it. There's going to be a whole lecture on management of obesity, another lecture on management of non-communicable diseases generally, where we'll be talking about special nutrition, uh, special nutrition therapy for different conditions and all of that. So I think as you go on in the lectures, you get used to some of these terms, you, you'll be more satisfied. But in the interim, you can download these books and read them. You can order the hard copies. You can go on my website, there are a lot of resources there so that you get used to these things. And this course should be the most interesting course for you. I wish you a nice day with us. Thank you very much, ma. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, ma. Please don't, please don't forget to send the letter slide to our review. Okay. Uh, will you send me your WhatsApp? Okay, no. I can send it to you on WhatsApp or you send me your email. And no, no. I will do the two. I'll, okay. I'll tell you. Okay. No problem. I've also sent you my website so that you can um, look at the resources and just enjoy yourself with those resources. We'll definitely do that. Okay. Bye. Thank you, ma. Bye-bye, ma. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, ma. Bye-bye. Uh, I was thinking you were going to say something, ma. Pardon me? No, no, no. Not, at, not to you, ma. Okay. Okay, so I also put my what I think I put my phone number on the screen. So you feel free to ask questions during the day. <laughs> my day is between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. Feel free to ask questions, any concern, any any way I can assist you on this program. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.